Yeah, so we are going to have um, our keynote address uh, given by one eminent scholar, Tom Odiambo from uh, the University of Nairobi. So Tom is um, a columnist with the Daily Nation. He's a renowned teacher. He's been teaching, I think, for the last 15 years, if I'm right, Tom. How many years have you been teaching? 20 years I was under valuing his, his, his experience. So Tom is going to present a very uh, topical topic on uh, the African Academy and African academics. And I think if you watch the news, especially with our case in Kenya, you realize that our situation is kind of uh, a very difficult one because the kind of political leadership that we have has little interest in what academics and the academy, uh, the kind of role they have to play in development because there's a thinking of, in, that there's a new thinking, I think in two, in two spheres. One, the thinking that the academy should be subjected to market forces. And I think you've seen in the new revisions of um, how universities are supposed to be funded, there is a big kind of market undertones in what we have. And what is happening in Kenya is not just peculiar to Kenya. If you watch the news in the UK, in parts of Europe, in parts of America, there is a big shift in terms of the importance given to the academy and the academics. There is also another shift in Kenya where the academy is mostly, and I think practically, uh, administrative. And one of our eminent scholars, I think, Karuti Kanyinga from the University of Nairobi as well, has written about the administrative academy as opposed to the academic academy. So without um, going further into what Tom is going to discuss, I think it's time that we invite him to give his keynote. And Tom, welcome. The floor is yours. So let's clap for Tom as he comes. Yes, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the afternoon sessions are generally not very encu encouraging sessions. You would generally would have eaten, um, and you have to, the intestines have to process the food. So often the reason you sleep or you doze off, it's not because you are old or because you are, you're just lazy, it's because, uh, the, the body is processing the food. So I, I often encourage my students in the afternoon sessions to doze a little bit. Dozing is good for you because it often allows you, it allows you to dream a little bit. And this is a world where even dreams have become very difficult. It's very difficult to dream. Um, so um, I, I, am, I am extremely grateful to, to the organizers, all the organizers of this event for allowing me to come and stand before you. Uh, those of you who are present, and those of you who are present on their screens, wherever in the world, to speak a little bit about a topic that is not new. It is absolutely not new, but it's a topic that is quite urgent. And it's urgent because, for me, in a very practical way, uh, I have been in school uh, variously since the Day of the Lord, uh, 1978, and I've only been out of school uh, between 1992 when I sat my high school exam and 1994 when I joined uh, the university. Ever since then, I've hung around school, whether it's primary school, secondary school, college, or university. Um, there are enough people in this room, there are enough people in this room, I can count them, who used the tablet in the 70s. If you're in this room and you use the tablet in the 60s and 70s, can I see your hand up? You used it. I am 100% sure you used the tablet. Um, and the people who use the tablet in the 70s no longer know how to use it because this is a different kind of tablet. 
For those who don't know the tablet I'm talking about, is exactly there was a tablet in the 70s, the exact size of the one you are using, and we had to write on it using the chalk. Um, and that just tells you how far um, education has moved. Now you write on your tablet using a pen. I'm just doing these anecdotes to allow those who are standing out to get in. But I would like to start my presentation with a little bit of an introduction to kind of it might become relevant to you after the discussion. It might also not actually be relevant to you anyway, but you have to listen since you are here. And it, it's in, in a newly released book, uh, the book is called Lucky Girl by Irene Mushemi Ndiritu. It was done, it was released by the Dial Press, which is part of Random House. The book was launched yesterday, I couldn't come here, neither could I go to the launch. Um, the book is published this year. It was launched yesterday. The protagonist is caught up in an existentialist crisis after sitting her high school exams. She wishes to join university, but she doesn't want to school locally. The protagonist is Kenyan. The book is set in Kenya. I quote from the book, A Conversation. Soila is a very smart, is very smart and ambitious. Nasserian jumped in. She's going to waste her best years at the university here with all the student protests and the professor's strikes. She'll also be demoralized. What is the point of all that when she can go so far in life? So Soila is arguing with the mother that she cannot afford to study here in Nairobi. So she wants to go abroad. There is a reason. The reason is not that she really wants to go abroad. So you have to read the book to find out the reason. But the way this is put is a story in itself, is a thesis, it's a book. Okay? And so I would say that it's a great honor to stand before you all present here physically and those joining us virtually to speak in honor of an African scholar of Professor Toin Falola Stecher. I hope that my words will partially add to the conversation that began yesterday at this conference and that will also hopefully provoke more conversations going into tomorrow and tomorrow and the next Toin Falola conference and any other conference that energizes African academies and African academics. I must say that this conference happens at a time when Africa is experiencing another false start, another false dawn. Uh, wasn't this supposed to be the African century? There are enough people in this room who remember the African Renaissance of Tabumbik, of African scholars visiting Timbuktu. Of course, I also know that there are enough students in here who don't know, African students who don't know, that the first major university in Africa was at Timbuktu, and that there are enough students in here who don't know, and it's not their problem, it's our problem as academics and the academy, that actually the first surgery, the first ever recorded surgery was done along River Nile. And that then this was borrowed into Egypt, and then this borrowed into Europe, and then it was brought back to us here, right? And so, African op optimists had claimed that Africa would experience an unprecedented accelerated economic growth, that its youth bulge would not only provide labor for the goods and services from the new industries, but also be a sustained, sustained consumers for the same that Africa would be the new frontier for technological innovation and economic investment, and that Africa would be more or less the destination for much of the global humanity. This is a story that there are enough people in this room who understand, the African Renaissance story. Today, Afro-pessimists laugh at Africa. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get this to, to scroll. Today, Afro-pessimists laugh at Africa, pointing to raging wars across the continent, the recent spate of military coups, especially in West Africa, 
starvation, environmental disaster, massive unemployment, especially of the youth, stagnation or decline in many other indicators of human growth, such as child and mother mortality, school enrollment, and literacy rates, migration to the global north. We had a whole session on migration, internal, outwards, uh, in the other room. Decline in or failure of democracy in many countries on the continent, among others. It is difficult to remain hopeful in such conditions. But human beings are naturally optimistic. Indeed, this very conference is an indicator of the spirit of human endurance and hope. For this conference on Africa's historical and contemporary realities is a celebration of that which still unites Africa, despite the winds of incertitude, economic hardships, and a seeming state of hopelessness. And that is a shared fate. You're in this room because you share fate. You share fate as Africans. You share fate as academics. And you share fate as humans. It is this shared faith that I wish to speak to in this brief address with reference to the state of the African Academy and the African Academic. I know that I am walking on a well-beaten path. More accomplished intellectual elders, Tandekam Kandawire, go and read his article, his uh, inaugural speech at London School of Economics and Political Science, Running While Others Walk, Knowledge and the Challenge of Africa's Development. Uh, Issa Shivji, with the African University. Mahmoud Mamdani, apart from several publications on the African intelligentsia, the one that stands out, which you must read if you work in a university or you want to hang around a university, is Scholars in the Marketplace. The Dilemmas of Neoliberal Reform at Makerere University, 1989 to 2005, which was published in 2007. These easily come to my mind. They have walked this path before me and have eloquently spoken about the seeming tragedy of both the academy and the, acad the academic in Africa. I only wish to add my own observations on what is happening today and how to think through the problem. Universities were originally places where people thought through problems. The history of universities says, whether it's in the Islamic world or in the Christian world, in the Christian world, it was the monasteries. And people went to the monasteries not to become priests because they stopped over because it was a place where you could get a meal, you could get water, and then exchange ideas. So the only reason it's called a university is because people came from all over and met together. It's the meaning of universal, isn't it? So we need to think through problems. Universities, when I was being formatted, the, the Catholics have a fresh formation. When I was being formatted at high school to go to university, my teachers would say, you argue too much. Take that to the university. And then I arrived in the university, and then I found lecturers who said, you argue too much. And I got a bit confused. But I hung around. I possibly tell my students that in another way. So I'm also aware that I'm oversimplifying this question by speaking about the African academy and the African academic. For Africa is not a country, to use the popular cliche. There's actually a publication, I think, called Africa is not a country. But Africa is not a country. But I use Africa here only as an analytical category to signify not only the state of belonging to a geographical space, but also the fact of interconnectedness of the academic history on the continent, a fact that is confirmed by the hosting of this conference here at Kenyatta University, um, which is in Kiambu County, Makoa, isn't it? Uh, is in Nairobi County, uh, Kenya. The last time I heard somebody say it's in Kiambu County. Um, so, so Makoha, you don't know. You know, you, you know, you, 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 you resolutely said Nairobi County. But the last time I checked reports from Kiambu County talking about collecting revenue here. Anyway, so for those of you who are here and you don't know, if you are a Nigerian, you have states. We have counties. 
Uh, it's just R between county and country, isn't it? Soon some of these counties will claim they want to be countries. And that's something for us to think about. However, we may wish to remember that the African education system and the university in its present form was a colonial project with a defined pedagogy, philosophy, and even expected outcome. In other words, to date, the African Academy is still very much modeled along Western roots. African universities, whether private or public, still swear by their non-African roots. And that's what I was saying, that it's surprising and interesting that the Greeks came to Egypt to find out about knowledge, which they took to Greece, and which other Europeans then borrowed from them. The Egyptians actually got the knowledge from the Nubians in Sudan. You all who are in this room remember very well that to be the king of Egypt, you had to have the civil service only made up of eunuchs. And these eunuchs, their job was to keep the intellectual and the records, intellectual history of that society and the records of that society. And the eunuchs were Nubians. And this thing goes around like this. So if we cry today about the tragedy of the African Academy and the tragedy of the African Academic is simply because we've refused to read our history and borrow from it. I think that's the key point. And that's what I got from Toyn Falol. That's what reading him, that's what I got. He doesn't reference it that way, but he tells you to think that way. So, um, it's the idea uh, that African universities are modeled on their European roots, I think should trouble us. That's why I'm saying I doubt that African students at universities today are taught about Egypt and Timbuktu. If you're in this room and you remember the great project to preserve the Timbuktu manuscripts, raise your hand. Against the Timbuktu manuscripts, against ISIS, raise your hand. There is actually a book written by a, a journalist traveler on this. This is a very interesting thing to think about, that our problems today of the African Academy and the academic have layers and layers of history. And if these students are not taught about the significance of Egypt, Timbuktu, Nubia, in the classroom, then they're gonna run into the problems of defining exactly what's the African Academy and the African Academic, okay? But isn't this the problem of African, uh, so if they are not being taught this, isn't this the problem of African historical and contemporary reality? It is. That Africa's own history is hardly taught in African universities that it exists where it does on the periphery of the academy and even its own researchers, teachers and practitioners are probably unsure of whether it still has value. And this context should trouble all of us who are assembled here today. For the African Academy is not only deficient today in many ways, probably its most significant risk is the risk of failing as an academy in total. There are many shades to the problem of the African Academy, including the most common one, Bernardine, insufficient funding. Insufficient funding. It's a statement made, if you apply for money, they write, no funding. There's no money. Lack of or decayed and inadequate infrastructure. If a lecturer can't sit in a room on their own and close the door to read and think, there's no university. If there are 10 lecturers in a room, what they'll do, they'll play Scrabble or they fill the crossword or they will share uh, photos of half-nude people from the OASA groups. Lack of research capacity. Now, 
if you are in this room and you teach in any university, I am sure you have made this statement. What's wrong with these postgraduate students of today? They can't even just write an introduction to a, a research proposal. We'll even write a concept note. I doubt if this thing will lead into uh, a proposal itself. Insufficient staff. Ah, if you are teaching uh, 300 students plus, and the university is telling you, we'll pay you for those extra students, you are just a celebrated high school teacher. In fact, high school teachers are not even allowed to teach 100 students by law. They are not. By law, they are not. I know. I taught in high school. I know. I still hang around people teaching high school. People must manage. Did you know that if you are a university lecturer here, did you know that it's criminal for a high school teacher to teach 100 students at a go? They have to break them into two groups of 50-50. And if you go where they teach 100 at a go, it's simply, it's simply because that's the only teacher around. So I've gone to schools where the English language teacher is also the history teacher and he masquerades as a maths teacher when there is opportunity. <laughs> and the support teacher for the maths teacher is the girl who finished school last year and got an A plus in mathematics. So if you are teaching a thousand students here and you are working with your hands in the pocket, you're not teaching. That's a crusade. Okay? It's a religious crusade. Yeah, you go into a crusade. You understand? Poorly prepared undergraduate students. 80% of our students who joined first year here were copycats. They were copying notes for the entire year from Form 1 to Form 4. Then they arrive here and you start teaching the way I do. I only teach by seminars. And they become very frustrated. And you become very frustrated yourself. And if you are foolish... You start insulting them, but they are recording you on their phones. And then Bernadine calls you and says, Mwalimu, could we have a chat? You know, these university administrators are also not very good. And you want to call a lecturer, you say, can we have a cup of coffee? But they say, could we have a chat? So yes, Mwalimu, we can have a chat on WhatsApp. No, I mean, can you see me now in my office? You understand? Because... You are teaching poorly prepared students. And just to kind of sidetrack, apparently the Ministry of Education in Kenya is saying the students who cheated to pass exams to join university will now have to sit university entry exams. Who tells them they won't cheat again? And who tells them we will not assist them to cheat? You, you think my daughter will fail the exams? If you fail my daughter, I'll fail your son. Who tells them we will not do that? It's a, it's, a, it's a terrifying situation if you are a lecturer uh, and you are teaching a thousand students the way I know Makohan and Lugano are doing. Start a church. It's a much more profitable business, right? Um, weak graduate students. Now, you all know that you are here as a university teacher because you are once a graduate student. Now, we have extremely weak graduate students. And the reason they are weak is because of all the problems I've listed before. So they don't have access to the latest journals, the latest books. They don't have access to seminars. I grew up as a seminar student from third year at Moore University. I went to Vitz University for my MA. I was never taught. I don't remember a lecturer who actually lectured me. They all ran seminars. So by the time you finish your first semester, you could do a seminar on your own. Now, all these, all these have led to what, uh, as Lugano said, some scholars have called the administrative university uh, versus the academic or the intellectual university. The point being that there's a massive division in the university between the administrators who are often driven to the office in university vehicles. They sit in offices that have carpets and fridges and television sets and microwaves, and they have tea. Uh, and then they issue a memo that from next semester, because of budgetary cuts, 
departments may not offer tea. So you think that they've cut tea, and I'm happy at that because I don't drink tea with sugar. Then they add a caveat that we may not even be able to offer drinking water. In Africa, in Africa, drinking water. Even in this conference, they knew we are in Africa. They put drinking water here. Because in Africa, what brings you, when you want to get into somebody's home and to eat for free, you knock and you say, can I have some water? And they say, yeah, 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 you will have some water. But get in, why are you living with the blessings? So the administrative university is disblessing all of us who are teaching. And consequently, uh, the academics then decide they are going to hustle. Right? So they all become consultants. Okay? Or part-timing elsewhere. Part elsewhere, whatever that means. And part-timing is not a bad thing because it simply means you are testing your knowledge elsewhere. But think about a typical situation, right? So, so, so if you are in Nigeria, somebody is teaching in uh, Ibadan, but they also have classes in Enugu, and uh, Legos, and often they actually uh, say, you know, Benin, people in Benin, universities in Benin don't have lectures, so they cross the border, okay? Now, this quandary needs to be contextualized historically, and the reason it needs to be contextualized historically is because our universities are like our country's borrowed models they borrowed colonial models, but they never actually thought through how those colonial models were structured. You see, the colonial models had a raison d'etat. They had a raison d'etat. There was a justification for them. So when they were borrowed wholesomely, okay, without any adaptation, they worked. So there's a generation here, I can see one or two in this room, that I want to call the golden generation of African intellectuals. That's where Toyin Falola is. These were men and women who could think, who could meet in the common senior room and tell the principal, Mr. Principal, I am the owner of the course that I teach. We can negotiate about how I teach it, but you cannot impose administrative injunction on how I teach it. I'll give you an example. A court puppy take was not a professor of literature. He was a professor of African anthropology and religion. But a court puppy take used to teach in literature once in a while. So court puppy take is famous at the University of Nairobi for examining a thesis. Right? And then he was asked administratively to give the report and a mark. And then he told the administrator who was asking him, the student actually did commendably, and the student passed. And the administrator said, no, 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 no. I want the report and the mark. And the court said, the thesis was oral. The examination was oral. The report is oral. And the mark is oral. What's the problem? And this is, this, is, this is exactly the problem of borrowing structures and systems and not adapting them. So what we spend all the time in conferences, including this one, is to talk about the colonial and post-colonial problem. No, the white people left. They left. When they left, this place was a barracks. This one here. That's why once in a while a bell rings. It's a barracks. It's a military barracks. Okay? The bell will ring. And people come here who don't know, say, oh, Kenyatta University is a high school. The bell rings. The bell rings in a good university does. Okay? And then it was made into a college to train teachers. Right? But we never adapted the model. We just adopted it. And so, the African teacher, the golden generation of the 1960s, were also fairly 
uh, elitist, but they had the freedom to actually experiment. So if you read Isa Shivji, he tells you that they taught theory in class. They taught theory in class. And then they went to the villages to actually try to apply the theory. Read Isa Shivji. This is the entire process of uh, adoption and adaptation of whether it's Igbo meets Igbo practices of uh, cultural production, reproduction in West Africa, the stuff Kenyan professors love, all that stuff was there was theory that what's exactly, why is Greek theater more significant than Yoruba theater? And the comparison is exactly why Wale Shoinka wrote the way he wrote, because he actually would go and meet people who produce Yoruba theater. And he would see the reason to merge it with Greek theater. So there was an adoption and adaptation. So the golden generation, which is passing away, then hands over the mantle to the, what I would call the silver generation. The silver generation Eventually, because it found staying around quite difficult, because of the reasons I've listed, including now the state claiming that it would wish to control the universities, the silver generation started to travel around, but around towards Europe and North America and Asia. The golden generation, for your information, traveled into Africa. So this country had Ugandan professors, it had Ghanaian professors, we even had a Ghanaian chief justice in this country. It had South African academics here. If you cross the road into Tanzania, you had Zambian Malawian scholars. If you cross the road into Nigeria, you had Kenyan academics visiting. That's the golden generation. The silver generation did not have this opportunity because the state now became too controlling. And it started to cross the borders, the Atlantic. It kind of gave, did what you would call the first major wave of, of intellectual uh, slavery. Because it's, it's, they, they, they would not really accept the term slavery, but that's exactly what happened. And this was the, the best brains from the continent crossing the Atlantic and working elsewhere. And what that meant is that for those who remained around, uh, mentoring started to decline, to die. Research started to decline, to die. Basic research, which is at the foundation of all Syria's academies, all Syria's universities do basic research, declined. Believe you me, there are people in this room who have been taught by professors who have endlessly cited books they have never read. And I'll tell you two of those books. One of those books is called Karl Marx. It's just that I've never seen it. <laughs> what I know is that there are three volumes of Dark Capital by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. So I have met professors who talk about Karl Marx writing in the capital. And I say, oh, and what happened to Frederick Engels? Say, so, oh, okay. And the other one that African academics love and cite, and I'm sure they've never read, is Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa which then moves me to what I would call, how do we start to think about getting out of this? And I think if you're in this room, I would want you, I would wish, if you have, if you have not, if you're in this room and you have not read, if you have not read Toin Falola's The Power of African Culture, you must read it. And let's have a conversation and let you convince me if Toin Falola is spending endless amounts of time talking about colonization and decolonization. No, he's just 
doing basic research. And if you're in this room and you've not read Olufe Mitai was against decolonization, taking African agency seriously, take some time and read it. Because it will start to disabuse you of something that I've thought about. I've thought about until I read parts of. I read, now, if you're in this room and you are a miracle maker, I've started to believe in miracles. Once you reach 50, you start believing in miracles. So I had partly read Olufe Mitaiwo's essay on against decolonization. And I was wondering, how will I read the book? And then five days ago, my student, my student, who is now in America, walks into the room and gives me the book. Because Olufe Mitaiwo's essay is available online. You just go to look for it. And the key thing in these two uh, scholars, what twins them, I would say, in my reading, is the idea of finding ways and activating African agency. And if you activate African agency, uh, I think you would then start to rethink our obsession with this idea of colonialism and post-colonialism. Where did we post-colonialism? There's a whole two generations in here um, that has got very little or no memory of what colonialism was or is. And the way I think, and I just want to actually borrow and repeat here ideas that exist in print. And like I said, it's a Shivji. I said, Tandeka Mkandawire. Like I said, Mahmoud Mamdani have spoken about these issues. But I want to repost them here because this conference is a classic example of how we can do African studies and regenerate the spirit of the African Academy, but also make the life of the African academic productive. The first one, and I'll run through them because I think I have about five minutes. Okay, I'll run through them and I will highlight three or four. We got to decolonize the university and I'll borrow here Taiwo's phrase by taking African agency seriously. And decolonizing the university has got nothing to do with colonialism. It's simply what I said before. We adopted colonial theory and praxis. And then we never adapted them. We never reconditioned them. This is interesting. If you get out of this place and you are a Japanese and you had used a Nissan Kombi somewhere in Tokyo, you will be shocked how Kenyans in Nairobi have adapted the Nissan Kombi. They even just call it Nissan. They just call them Nissan. So the word Nissan means a Nissan, it means Toyota, it means Volkswagen. So do you understand why I was saying we either do basic research as academics, as African academics, or we don't make claims to being African academics. And Taiwo's argument about decolonizing African pedagogy, decolonizing African history, African culture, is to stop giving agency to colonial theory and practices. Because when you say decolonization in Africa, and you read, you read, read any paper, I challenge you, read any paper that has a phrase, colonialism and decolonization in Africa, I swear, Three quarters of the references will be from the global West. And there will be refutations. So by the time you get into the deep end of the paper, there is actually no affirmation of the African condition. The paper has been doing refutation, refutation, refutation. The way I responded to that is that I sat in my office at the University of Nairobi and wrote a proposal 
for a journal called Eastern African Literary and Cultural Studies. I didn't say a journal to refute colonial scholarship on Eastern African and Literary Studies. So the journal is published online by Taylor and Francis. It's based in Europe, but it's spreading Eastern African literary and cultural knowledge. So Taiwo's argument is that you got to decolonize the way you think. He actually has an, a nice phrase, decolonize two, not one. And I, I think this is a, a wonderful argument. And that is how, if you read The Power of African Culture by Toyin Falola, he essentially does basic research. So if he's talking about economic production and consumption, you will actually find images of fishermen there. Now, I have read papers, endless papers by young African scholars, and you start to struggle where is the article situated. I, I, if you watch TV in this country, I'm very sure in Nigeria, I'm very sure in Cameroon, in Uganda, you will hear a newscaster say, in the remote district of, remote from where? Remote is an anthropological term from colonial researchers. Because it was remote from the post where fellow white people were. So it's remote. We sit in Nairobi and you say, Trukana is remote, remote from where? Okay, that's what uh, Taiwo, then Africanize the African University. In fact, the fact that this conference could be held here is a reflection of what I mean by Africanize the African University and pedagogy. I, I was quite surprised and impressed that African Literature Association, which is largely an American conference, and the African Studies Association, which is largely an American conference, that even they have realized why it is important to hold those conferences in Africa. Yet our own universities and our own academics think that the mark of quality is to read your paper in Europe um, and America. Yeah, I'm winding up. Um, and I'll give an anecdote despite the timekeeper uh, saying I should wind up. I'll give you an anecdote. The last time I went to the University of Cambridge to read an academic paper, the conference convener had to apologize to scholars from Nigeria because of the huge number of Nigerian academics who are turned back at Heathrow. You know that thing where they tell you that before you get the visa, you must indicate if you have reserved and then booked your accommodation. There is that, if you are applying for a British visa, they ask you, now these guys reserved but did not book. So when they arrived at Heathrow, they were told, we don't know where you will be domiciled, so we can't trace you. So they were sent back. And that's what I mean by, the, 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 let me just read through them. Then focus on basic research. I think I've highlighted why we need to focus on basic research. I think what we have, this endless theoretical review of existing academic publications, and then somebody hooking uh, two or three paragraphs and saying that this is research uh, from such and such a place. We got to go back and for, collaborate within and without the country, regionally, continentally, globally. I think this is a classic example, Wanadine. Form partnerships with international or regional research centers and use them as short and long-term research collaborators because of their resources and networks. I think when the, this conference is a classic example. Initiate research community of practitioners. I, I listened in the morning to gender, discussions around gender and women. I am 100% sure that after this conference, those people will never talk again. I was in another room where there was massive presentation on migration. If we can't do that, we can't survive. If we can't initiate communities of practice, which is an old argument that's very feasible for us, deliberately mentor future scholars. Hold the hand of somebody. Seek to influence policy. Almost every paper that was read here in the morning 
the ones that I attended there, those are policy influencing papers. But they will end up in a journal somewhere in Europe that nobody reads uh, just because you want to go for promotion. And you could easily turn it into a policy statement. Um, found a pedagogic philosophy by borrowing years, but also looking at local context. I think um, uh, Odero Ruka, uh, before he died, he actually had started to experiment with philosophy in this country. But essentially, essentially just interviewing old people or people who are seen to be more knowledgeable about a subject. And this had started to form into something he was calling sage philosophy. And there's nothing, if you read Hutwinji, you read Kwesi Wiredu, all that these guys did, their work is really founded in a local understanding of the world. Lastly, uh, I think we need, there's nothing wrong with consultancy, but there's so much knowledge that is stuck in consultancy reports that's just dead. Incredible knowledge. And what does, it goes to Europe, then it's transformed into books and journal articles, which we then review, or we have to read in classes. So if we could think seriously about these uh, consultancy reports as sources, initial sources of actually significant knowledge in Africa, we could be doing what the generation of Toin Falola were doing by just really being very basic research. I wish, I wish, I, re I really wish to end this conversation by quoting Tandekam Kandawire. Uh, in his inaugural speech at the London School of Economics, um, he said, and if Africa will have to run, the university will have to sprint. Forget the politicians. They always say African universities are not productive enough, but all of them register for evening classes. And all of them look for honorary degrees. So Africa's growth will still depend on African academies and African academics. So we have to run in order for the rest of them to catch up. But I refreshed and let Kandawire's statement and say, if African universities have to grow sustainably, then African academics will have to think like the proverbial tortoise. Remember the tortoise? with the race again as the hare. And he knows he can't beat the hare. So what does he do? He calls all his cousins and plants them along the road. That's the only way we academics may, may come to retake the stake in the university from the administrative university. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. So because we don't have so much time, so I'll give uh, our discussant 10 minutes to respond, then Q&A session, about three questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair of the session, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, really not to discuss uh, what has been said by uh, my colleague Tom Odiambo from the University of Nairobi's uh, famous Department of Literature, uh, but really just to uh, um, tease out some of the things that uh, he has said um, in his uh, afternoon of sharing. Uh, it's a um, bit of an oversight of the chair that uh, he has not introduced uh, the discussant. My name is Dr. Mako, and I also come from the Department of Literature but which is domiciled in this university. So we work with Dr. Tom Odiambo uh, across the divide uh, between University of Nairobi and here uh, in uh, areas and terrains of intellectual nature uh, which we all are familiar with. Being people who are domiciled in the humanities, there are a few concepts that Tom has um, touched on which uh, need um, uh, more uh, penetrative reflection. For example, he has talked about um, the need to look at African epistemologies and knowledge spaces in a generational point of view. That uh, the work that has been cut out and uh, archived in global intellectual discourse as African knowledges is work that is not being produced by one body or one knowledge community 
of one generation, that it takes uh, generational uh, approaches to uh, conceptualization of what African knowledge means uh, to be able to understand uh, where we were, where we are now, and where we desire to go. I think this is the work, uh, Tom, that um, uh, the likes of Thandika Mkandawire and others working under the banner of Codestria have been trying to do uh, over time. Uh, the people uh, in Dakar uh, under the Codestria um, umbrella, Council for the Development of Social Sciences Research in, in Africa, have been really keen not only in building bridges between the diverse African uh, scholars in their, in their landscapes and nations where they come from, but also the building bridges between works that have been conducted uh, through different generations from the 1960s, 1970s, 80s, 90s, and even where we are today, with the executive director uh, at Codesria being a Kenyan from this university uh, initially. He was here just two weeks ago, I guess, uh, and he gave us wonderful uh, reflections of the kind of work that is being done in Dakar today. We were listening to him, uh, Dr. Godwin Siundu, uh, Godwin um, Murunga, sorry, and we were very, good, uh, we were very, very happy to, to see that the work that is being produced by the current generation of scholars uh, domiciled in that particular association or organization uh, does not build uh, out of a vacuum. It speaks to the works of Mamdani, Shivji, and others, including Professor Seka, uh, who is sitting uh, amidst us. So what I've discovered from what you're saying today is that knowledges are not only produced in communities, but these communities are also spatially and, temporar uh, spatially and temporarily uh, located uh, each to each. Then you've said also something very interesting. There is a, there is a way in which, uh, for example, we adapt uh, things from elsewhere including structures, practices, uh, ideologies, and even uh, traditions, but we do not uh, adopt them uh, with, adapt we, we adopt them from elsewhere, but we do not adapt them to our local um, uh, situations or our local demands or even terrains. And uh, I want to use a word which is familiar with all of us, a word which is key in post-structuralist discourse. Uh, it's a word which comes out of a punctuation mark um, called a caesura. And a caesura is something we always uh, use when we are writing. When you write a sentence, then you get midway in that sentence, you, don't, you do not complete it. You put a series of full stops, meaning that there is enough to be said, but it has not been said. So whenever you write a sentence and you stop midway, and you put those three or four dots, whether it's by a computer or whether it's by a pen, uh, that particular punctuation mark is not an exclamation mark. It's not a full stop. It's not a, a question mark. We have a name for it, and it's called a caesura. It means a kind of disruption, a disruption of either thought or a disruption of expression. And this caesura, for me, uh, as a concept, works very well to underscore the flow of African history that was interrupted by the discourses of colonialism and imperialism. And much later, we also had a second successive caesura when we now interrupted the colonial project by instigating decolonization. So we now have a situation chair of a double caesura, uh, which then uh, helps us to frame our minds around the ideas that Tom is talking about. The idea of disruptions in colonization, the ideas of disruption in decolonization, and all these ideas of uh, disruptions uh, then create that uh, grammar of instability that we seek to uh, uh, confront using different uh, disciplines. So there is that disruption, there is the instability that ensues out of it, and the attempt at managing these instabilities, which you have put in very uh, lucid terms within the structure of academics and academia. Then there is also the question which he has raised about inheritances and legacies, which sometimes are contested and contestatory. And um, here one would want to work with the idea of traces as expressed in the works of Derrida, uh, um, the famous deconstructionist. And the idea that uh, language and even forms of expression cannot ideally and totally express that which we seek to know, uh, but can only approximate it to an appreciable degree, that idea has also come out in his works. He says that there is still a lot of work to be done in terms of expressing some of the um, aporias that we continue to see within our practices of knowledge, uh, formation, knowledge making, uh, knowledge instigation, and knowledge perpetuation. 
Uh, finally, um, he has also talked about the importance of um, sitting back and thinking really deeply uh, about the state and status of the African uh, university in the 21st century. He mentioned a book which brings this particular discussion to the fore, but I want to quote uh, a book which we are all familiar with, actually appearing in twin volumes, uh, uh, the book by uh, Kodesri again, uh, but edited by Adebayo Olukoshi and uh, Paul Tiambezeleza. At the beginning of this particular century, 20 years ago, published in 2003, they issued under Kodesri two volumes uh, called uh, The African University in the 21st Century. We have the volume one, and we also have volume two. Volume one tries to tease out the problems that are assailing, are, are assailing and besieging the African Academy, and in volume two, they try to focus on uh, 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 troubleshooting and the possible ways forward. These twin uh, volumes are indispensable to the audience that is seated here. That if we really want to know what is ailing the African Academy, we may want to interact with that kind of volume uh, by Adebo Olukoshi and Paul Tiambi Zeleza, which of course instigates uh, thought around questions of funding, questions of in structure, uh, infrastructure and structural uh, pitfalls, questions of management, etc., etc. But at that point, I would wish, Tom, that you uh, later come back, uh, maybe through um, a, um, a reflection, and think not only about the administrative university vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the academic university. I studied in Germany uh, for my um, uh, doctorate work um, some 15 years ago now, uh, and I noted that the universities there are clustered differently. They talk about a research university versus a teaching university. So you can go to a university like FU or Free University of Berlin, which is well known for the teaching and the grooming and the pedagogies. Then you can go to Technical University of Berlin, which is more known for the research, interventions, and so on and so forth. So I'd wish us to uh, further um, diversify that dichotomy of an administrative university versus uh, an academic university to think also about the other binary of a teaching university versus a research university. Once we do that, then we can delineate the universities that we have within uh, a topography like Kenya and argue that these ones will be teaching universities. They'll keep producing the manpower in terms of um, uh, this and that. And we'll also have research universities, which will then be charged with uh, intervening in some of the problems that we so have uh, in this terrain. Otherwise, uh, Paul, uh, uh, I, I give you my personal applause, uh, Tom. You're always coherent, very intelligent. Uh, we look forward to the question and answer session, and some of the things that you've said will further be elaborated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Makaha. You've given us a very good summary of Tom's discussion. But one thing that I want to wonder before I open the floor for questions is that I was really intrigued by Tom's classification of our, of our scholars in terms of generations. So we have the golden generation of the goats, uh, the shivjis. We have the silver generation of the Sekas, who was my mentor here when I was a first year, second year, third year, student year. But I'm wondering where, Tom, you locate the current generation of part-timers and consultants. Are they, <laughs> are they stones? How would you call them? So I think we can have a moment of questions and answers. So yes, Professor. We can still hear you. Smoking with the intellect, he saw a few things which I exposed him to. And uh, the circles you have mentioned about Kodesri I'm very familiar with. I uh, have engaged Mahmoud Mamdani on his post-structuralism. It is, was published in African Sociological Review 
1997, that debate between me and Mamdani. Isa Shivji was kind of a trainer to me when I was undergoing the Governance Institute in Dakar in 1997. And so those debates that Dikam Kandawire was just exiting as the executive secretary of Codesria. And at that point, uh, having been sponsored by the Council for Development of Social Science Research in Africa, which gave me the entry into Codesria in 1988, I wonder, Codesria still has small grants for thesis writing. How many scholars here have utilized that opportunity to ask for funding from Codesria in order to do their research for their thesis at master's level and PhD level. And I want to ask a question. Does it need funds to form an epistemic community? I will give you a background of history department. In the 1980s, when using just the resources, meager resources available, we were able to hold, and Ogeno can attest to that, because he's my colleague and agent, seminars that were regular and were produced on psycho-styled materials. They were not computer. There were no computers. There was no internet at that time. But the discussions there were very engrossing, very involving. And some of us who are prepared, we were ground on that kind of grounding, grinding stone to be the kind of people we are today. So what did we do? We formed an epistemic community. And when we are talking about post-colonial, you know, I like the interventions you made about post. But you see, post is virtually a depiction of continuity. The next phase after colonialism. Should we be talking about post or should we be engaging the necessary discourses about decoloniality, whereby there are more epistemic engagements concerns with ontological configurations within our epistemic community to form alternatives and formulations that can challenge received notions and frameworks from abroad. It does not take lots of money for that to be realized. And my challenge to you is let us form an epistemic community. We have sharp minds that are sleeping. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, as the discussion goes uh, regarding the future of African universities, uh, actually I want to comment on the happening in Nigeria in particular between the academic uh, community uh, and the government or the states. Uh, over the years there has been actually contestations uh, between the states and the academic. Uh, community, in particular on the issue of funding and, uh, of course, university autonomy and other matters related to the improving the quality of universities in Nigeria. Um, this uh, struggle actually has been on since the military era, and the situation the universities found themselves today, especially the academia, is that um, we have seen the proliferation of private universities. And these private universities are mostly owned 
by the gatekeepers. You see even senators, governors, own private universities. And that has led to further decline in terms of funding to the public universities. Now, uh, the question is, what is the way forward for the academia? Uh, especially that uh, whenever they, in trying to demand for funding, this academic were forced to declare strike action as a last resort. But then the last time the universities were on strike, spent eight months, and the, actually the government stopped their salaries, and now the only weapon that the academia used to, to engage the government is strike. So that has, the last strike has proven that the, the strike is no longer an effective instrument in trying to uh, force the government to do the needful. So what is the way out for the academic community? Thank you. So our last question will come from our online audience. So do we have anybody at the media who can tell us if we have a question online? Nobody? Okay. So Tom, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, yes. Yes, Professor Seka, thank you very much um, for raising the, 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 the subject uh, of, um, of epistemic communities. I mean, it's very interesting. I'm very sure there are people in this, in this room who are members of the Bible study group. I am, 100% sure. And um, as a student uh, from high school, I was trained that the only way you will successfully finish your studies is if you belong to a study group. So for four years at Moy University, uh, Prof. Aseka, we read your work as part of a group of history students. In fact, we read incredibly a lot of books that were produced in this university because I was a student of education. And remember that, that uh, Kenyatta University overtook University of Nairobi as the model for training of education uh, students. And the program at Moi University came from here. And the idea was that we were trained um, to be members of what you might, you are calling epistemic community or research community or practice because we are going to be teachers and we end up in a staff room. Okay? So I always get surprised that people belong to a Bible study group can actually not form a community, research community of practitioners. It's an old concept, quite useful. Uh, Geoffrey here and I have been involved in training people in research community of practice. And in, in a research community of practice, you can have a non, somebody who has never gone to any formal school training, but has the language of interaction, to somebody who has done primary school, to somebody who has done secondary school, somebody who has done uh, university. So the first group that I ever trained had those four components. And I was training them with a colleague, Jonathan Ryle, John Ryle, on how to use oral literature and oral history to study their own local communities, which is actually about um, ground-based empirical basic research, which is what you are saying. And it's interesting that with the internet, I don't need the physical space. So we can actually, from this room, live here and say that because Bethel Logot is turning 94, we're going to have a totally virtual conference on Bethel Logot on his birthday. You know, so that's possible. Um, and the, the administrative as the academic uh, universities. This is becoming fashionable, but what's interesting is that the universities, African universities are still very much British universities. They are not American universities. American universities can have a president who is not necessarily a formal academic working in there. African universities, the VC, the DVC, the dean, the registrar, all these are people who are in the classroom. The joke I used to have is that they got tired of eating the chalk. It's, it's bad for their chests. So they will make sure they get stuck up there forever, and you will not go up there. But yet, what combines us, what links the two of us, is that we actually walk through the gate. Eh? We walk that through the, that gate. When they say, where are you going to work? They say, Kenyatta University. But the two of us, when I'm in the dean's vehicle at the gate, they'll say, where are you going? Say, University of... Kenyatta University, to do what? I work here. The dean will not say I'm the dean. He'll say I'm a teacher here. 
And so how did we forget the fact that we trained as teachers? And that's what I think, Taiwo, that's what I think Toin uh, Falola's work starts to teach you that uh, it is actually, these categories exist because they are superficial and they are important. And of course, we know that for the senior most positions in the universities, they have become political appointments. So it's not that you are the best amongst peers, okay? Senior most appointments. The VC ship and the DVC ship are negotiated. Um, the private versus the public universities. This one uh, is now a proper existentialist crisis. If you are in a public university and you have a legacy, you have a history, you better protect it. You better work so hard to still make it the prime point of reference. You are crying about universities sponsored by senators. That's no, that doesn't bother me because they will not admit 2,000 students. They'll admit about 500. Uh, there goes the bell eh, for post-colonial scholars. Yeah, uh, and finally, there is, there is a question from... Now, I've not finished that one. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, I'm just reminding post-colonial scholars that there's a topic. I mean, this is actually a very good topic. You, you understand? And the bell remains. Yeah, Prof. The, the, the title of your paper is, And the Bell Remains. The, 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 my friend, let me whisper. The private universities are not even a problem. What is going to make life difficult for the public universities is that all good American and European universities are opening branches around the corner. So your degree will be useless, whether it's from a local private or public university. Uh, the American University has, has been in Cairo for years, but other branches. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so the point is that I do not see these as competitors. What you do is that you become the point of reference because even those foreign universities use local academics as a point of reference. So protect your homestead. Stop. Uh, crying that somebody has built another home just in front of my gate, you know. The way you do it is you can go and, 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 and pull down the house at, 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 at night. So let's be very clear that actually the reason you have this kind of conference here is an affirmation of the potential and possibilities for do productive African studies here. Some last comment. Somebody called me eight years ago. They called me from Colombia, and they asked me, I have funding to do African studies, but my advice is telling me to go to School of Oriental and African Studies. What is wrong with coming to Nairobi, to Kenya, to study Africa? And I said, probably there is no Institute of African Studies at the University of Nairobi. There isn't one here, I'm suspicious that there is no one here. It might be there in name, just like the other one is there in name. And that's the point. So uh, thank you very much for this. And we hope that this is a conversation that continues in the corridors and that can go on in other spaces. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah, only that you didn't tell me why you locate the current crop of part-timers and consultants, whether they're gold, silver, or stones, or bronze. <laughs> <laughs> Bros. Okay, thank you so much. So, That's where I yeah, so, yeah, so let's applaud Tom and our uh, discussant once more. <laughs> and thank you all for attending this session. We are going to break for, uh, I think, this tea break, no tea break. So we are going to the next parallel sessions. We have two. There is one at um, the at this hall on um, post-colonial literature and the future of the arts. We have our chair there, Dr. Omeno Suji. Then the next session is there at um, uh, 
Studio 109, I think it's down here, on regional collaboration and diplomatic politics in post-colonial Africa. So once you're done, I think you're free to leave. Then tomorrow we meet at exactly 9.30. So after maybe you can come in with more logistical Uh, that has been a very interesting session. Um, I'm, I'm happy that uh, uh, it was chaired by somebody who uh, celebrates some of these issues. Uh, I want to uh, say that we are not going away. We just want to change uh, and move on. Those of us who are going to the other session to move on. Uh, then after those sessions, we'll have our coffee uh, downstairs in the next one hour, 15 minutes. So uh, parallel session number seven on post-colonial literature and the future of the arts will remain here. Uh, this is being chaired by Dr. Omeno Suji. And then the other uh, session on regional collaboration and diplomatic politics in post-colonial Africa, we are going to move on to the other uh, venue. Uh, it's going to be chaired by Dr. James Nyao. So the chairs of this session, please just take up so that we save on time. Savannah Honey to the Jusisha na the entire beekeeping value chain. Bivenom ni the most valuable product for beekeeping. Kila fre moja inakupa asali kilo moja hadi kilo moja na nusu. Piga hesabu yako. Utakuwa unavuna kiasi gani baada ya miezi mitatu. with a live transformation of worship experience. And have our minds renewed by the word of God on the word segment. And not forgetting new music Zahi Wiki and Indakwa Badona Wapatia Pale Wasani Omekwa Kiwakani. Make sure manzo me tune in because that was na flow pia pale mixes kwa wingi yani that was na come through and pia uh, performance yani uh, from our gospel artist up on gospel art from 7 to to 10 a.m. only on KU TV. makala ya usanii na sanaa tunazungumza na vijana barubaru wana muziki ambao wamebobea kwa nyimbo za mapenzi na tuna watch every post tunafanya sasa hivi inaenda viral like again and again every video mna post half a million views on tiktok 1 million views on tiktok 2 million views on tiktok ai ni kweli mkoshwa Eh, okay, I said to go my bill. Not on my pillow to receive your tattoo, and I was like, Oh, so we are here to stay. Ungana Nami Ruth Wanjiru Ijuma Wiki, Sakumi Nambilu Musu Yoni Nasatatu Usiku, 
kwa makala haya ya usanii na sanaa lazima nikuweke to self esteem and depression in children and it can also put them prone to diseases such as diabetes children don't have time to exercise like walking to school it's uh, you know you are either jumping in a, in a bus to school or you are going on a boda boda there's no walking very minimal walking so there's no enough exercise so children grow up their lifestyle does not help them to exercise their bodies for health Aspiring media practitioner, a graduate, or you just want to advance your skills in television production? Then welcome to Kenyatta University, where education meets innovation. KUTV, the premier university television station in Kenya, is now offering short courses in TV studio, field technical operations, and video editing. Through these courses, you will acquire hands-on skills on... presenting a paper for the Tony Parola International Conference um, titled Post-Colonial African Literature Using Nigeria as a Case Study. And the context for this paper will be encompassing um, from the introduction to the concept of post-colonialism and post-colonial literature. Uh, then I talked about the theories of post-colonial literature, basis of post-colonial literature, and an overview of post-colonial literature in Nigeria impact of post-colonial literature in Nigeria, then the conclusion. But before I dive into uh, the major part of the topic, I think it's very, very important for us um, to really understand why we really need to study post-colonial African literature. I noted that we study because beyond historical text and academic readings, it presents the African culture and ambition in a more interesting and engaging way. It is true that not everyone can can sit down to demystify uh, academic text. But when we look at our, our literature books, when we look at our prose, when we look at our, our, our poetry plays, it gives us an overview of what an African culture is. And I think that is very important for us to know as a major reason why we really need to dwell on this topic of uh, post colonial African literature. Then, um, Moving on to the next, um, talking about the concept of postcolonialism and postcolonial literature. Uh, the word postcolonialism itself it signifies the persistent impact of colonialization across time, periods, and geographical zone, uh, geographical regions. Pardon. In my paper, I, I try as much as possible to conceptualize two types of postcolonialism: the ethnic postcolonialism and the non-ethnic postcolonialism. Now, for the Ignited postcolonialism, I refer to it as a critical perspective that emerged in the later half of the 20th century, which seeks to understand and critique the historical and ongoing effects of colonialism on societies and culture around the world. Why it is why we might easily mix up these two, I think it is important for us to really define what these two really means. Why one signifies uh, um, a sort of persistent impact of of colonialism, of colonialization, something that can, something which you can generally also refer to as neocolonialism. The other one refers to a, a, as a sort of uh, critical perspective that emerged right after colonialism in response to colonialism and in response to erroneous beliefs that, uh, that has been known about Africa. Um, a couple of erroneous beliefs have been known about Africa. Um, one of it is uh, the fact that it's been noted that uh, Africa has no history, which we all know that either it is a lie. All right, so those are the things I think it's very, very important for us to note. And now when we talk about post-colonial literature itself, I believe that post-colonial literature frequently discusses the issues and the effects of a nation's decolonization, particularly when it comes to concerns about the political and cultural independence of once oppressed people and topics like racism. So when we look at the whole entirety of post-colonial literature, we look at it from the lens of a literary work trying to uh, provide uh, um, a summary or trying to provide a detailed look into one's oppressed set of person. So now looking at the theories of uh, post-colonialism, 
uh, there are three theories that I have here uh, around postcolonialism, and one of them is uh, Orientalism. The second is third place, and the third one is colonial discourse. And when we look at Orientalism now, Orientalism it's not really particular to uh, to Africa now. It's more particular to the far out to the east, as it is as, as it is a post-colonial theory that examines how the West has historically constructed and represented the East as a homogeneous, exotic, and inferior. Now, most importantly, situating uh, this uh, topic in African context, looking at colonial discourse by Franz Fanon, it's noted how colonialism has created a binary design of superior to inferior, which can be said to be the major discourse in African post-colonial literature. Now, uh, there was an era which I'm going to which I'm going to talk about in the faces of postcolonial literature, whereby uh, there were writers who wrote extensively a sort of resistance, a sort of um, self uh, reflection, a sort of painting the image of, of African images. You know, we have works of horror that 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 depict Africa as uh, as a dark state, as a dark continent. Now we now have uh, refuting works such as a uh, work of um, autonomous. Uh, Writers such as uh, Shinra Achebe, who tried as much as possible to rewrite that context. In history, in African historiography, we, we talk of people like uh, Kenneth O. Kadike, we talk of people like JFK, we talk of people like uh, Tony Palola, who have, through their work, tried to reconstruct the already erroneous belief about Africa. I think this is also one of the reasons why it is important for us to, to note the colonial discourse, which is being presented to us by, by Franz Fanon. Um, now moving on to basis of post-colonial literature, uh, I draw on four faces, and these faces are uh, protest and resistance, uh, reconstruction and reclamation, self-reflection, globalization and hybridization. For this globalization and hybridization, I believe this is uh, what uh, Dr. Tom, the keynote address, uh, the keynote speaker, spoke extensively about uh, uh, regarding. Adopt, adaptation and adaptation. Now, looking at it from the protest and resistance, the first generation of what, what I would put as the first site of our post-colonial literature that came out came as a form of resistance, came as a form of protest against the Western belief, against the Western culture. And when we look at works such as, um, uh, I believe, uh, maybe not to generalize, uh, works such as uh, Things Fall Apart by Gina Achebe, works like this are uh, try to reconstruct, or uh, uh, I mean, I've tried to protest against the Western belief. When we look at characters such as Ukon Kul, Tis Fall Apart, these are the works that have, uh, 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 these are the works that have give a sort of resistance to towards the Western belief. Then we're talking, we look at reconstruction and reclamation. Reconstruction in, in terms of now reconstructing the African, uh, reconstructing the African history to what is known to be, right? In, in history, when we discuss, when we discuss sources for all sources of history, we look at uh, uh, persons like uh, uh, um, J.P. Adajai, who introduced the multidimensional uh, disciplinary into studying of history, I mean, into writing or, or, or historicizing history. Now, we we'll also look at the self-reflection phase of colonial literature. I call this a, a, a sort of phase whereby now, African writers now look within themselves, look at things happening now in their society. It's no longer a protest, no longer a resistance to racism or colonialism. Now, it is now what is happening within the society. Then the last phase is the globalization and hybridization, which are, are, might look as form of uh, sort of Gen Z writers, right? Whereby we now have writers who are trying to, uh, so, uh, uh, which has you know, present a form of cultural acculturation around post-colonial literature. Now, post-colonial uh, post literature in Nigeria, an overview, I'm just going to uh, note what Edward said, Edward said noted, that post-colonial literature challenges the dominant discourses of colonialism and assets the cultural identities of the colonization. I think it is important for us to note that when we look at post-colonial literature, it is a uh, I want to put it as a form of um, misidentification, right? When we have when we have a sort of a misidentification by the West, it is important for us as as uh, as a continent now to look at it that no, we are not this. We are not one who does not have history. We are not one who does not have our own culture. Now, in response to that, now we are we are writing. Uh, 
literature that fits into our own it that fits into our own story that fits into our own um history and now uh, going to impact of colonialism literature in in nigeria so i've tried to look at this from various perspectives now one of the impacts of post-colonialism uh, post literature in nigeria is i talked about african spirituality now um when colonialism or uh, before before even before colonialism during the exploration period of course true to the colonialism period there were uh Believes there were religions brought to us from the West. Now, in an, in order to reconstruct this religion and Western belief, now we now have the African spirituality and uh, works like uh, the Pamwadre card, works like uh, that of uh, Ben Oprah Famous Road, and even indigenous writers such as Dio Pagua, who has written extensively on African spiritualism, uh, have been able to to create an atmosphere, has been able to 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 give a a, a grant for African spirituality. And they've been able to explore indigenous African beliefs uh, rather than the Western spirituality, rather than idealizing the Western uh, spirituality. Now, uh, we also have the societal values. And works like that of Things Fall Apart, which I really cherish very well, works like uh, Things Fall Apart by China Achebe, refuse the colonial myth that Africa is a dark continent uh, by highlighting the complexities of African civilization and the virtues of African culture. Then we have uh, societal injustice. And in this societal injustice, I've picked work like uh, I picked the work of Chuma Dangoza DJ, Africa Yellow Sun. Uh, if you've not read the, if you've not read that uh, that post, I think it's important for everyone to read it because it's it's this caused a, a major civil war in Nigeria, which is the Biafra War, which affected Nigeria. Now it is not it, we are no longer protesting or refuting racism. Now we are not looking into. What is happening within us? What is what is happening around us? What are the situation injustices that are happening around us? And also uh, gender equality. When we look at the works of Bushi um, Emeshita and Joyce of, of Motherhood. Sorry, Abraham. I'll, at, I'll give you another two minutes just to finish your thought. Sorry. Oh, okay. And now, in conclusion, in conclusion, generally, I think post-colonialism signify uh, significantly as influenced African literature, notably Nigerian literature, as my case study. Nigerian authors have used their writing to examine difficulties in the post-colonial world while claiming their own cultural identities and overcoming a variety of political, social, and cultural obstacles. I mean, in in addition, uh, I would like to put such something that. Nigerian authors have significantly influenced the growth of post-colonial literature by producing works that both question and disrupt the colonial narratives, while also examining the intricacies of the post-colonial world. And finally, I, I think I would like to put that the major aim or the whole entirety of this work is, is, uh, is to bring us back to the knowledge of the fact that, yes, there is an existence of African literature which we must, which we must um, adopt and which we must always put out to, to the world. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, let's applaud. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abraham. Uh, we'll take questions later uh, on, on that. Next, we have uh, post-colonial um, African literature, an interrogation of the present and the future. Uh, this is by Violet Barasa. She's also online, I think. Oh. oh, she's up there. Okay, Violet, take it from there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I, I want to assume that uh, I can be heard from the other end. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Violet Barasa, and uh, I'm going to present on postcolonial African literature, an interrogation of the present and the future. And I'm going to use uh, illustrations from Mufe Feswane's Welcome to Our Hail, Bro, and the Okendibes Arrows of Rain. And uh, I'll proceed from what uh, Abraham has uh, presented on post-colonial literature, and mine I'm looking at post-colonial literature in relation to the now, and how the now is influenced by the past, and of course how, what it implies for the future of the African arts in the post-colonial. 
And basically, I'll try to rush through what uh, I have. Uh, I'm looking at the introduction, the past, the now, and its implication on the future. And the key concerns in my paper, I look at identity and belonging in the contemporary Africa. I look at migration, and I look at uh, political leadership. And therefore, when we are talking about uh, African literature generally, we note that uh, African literature has tremendously grown from those uh, times or from our, the pre-colonial period through the colonial and where we are now. And what I note is that uh, when we are looking at this particular um, kind of uh, environment in Africa, you realize that the contemporary artist has uh, quite a lot of things to engage with. That we are here in the now, but the past has uh, some kind of bearing on the now, and it is this past that also kind of uh, has points to the future and the kind of uh, realities that uh, we seek to, you know, we, we, we are likely to encounter. So I'm saying that to understand African literature in the contemporary society, we there is need to understand the past. Just a moment. So there is need to understand the past, the now, and what it portends for the future. Why I'm talking about the past, the now, and the future is because of the that unique past that African postcolonial literatures have grappled with quite a number of uh, issues ranging from uh, political, you can look at uh, social, among others. And therefore, how do these kind of issues that African writers grapple with affect or influence the kind of life or things that we expect to have in the future? Then the question that arises from such a scenario of that past, the now, and the future is what does the past and the now imply for the future? This question proceeds from the argument that literature is a reflection of society and that what we interact with in literature takes is largely influenced by the social context of it is production. And therefore, being cognizant of what we have in our contemporary society or the kind of experiences we have in the contemporary society, then we are um, sure that what we are interacting with in literary text then is influenced by this post-coloniality that we are dealing with in this particular conference. And therefore, Africa's past is intertwined with Africa's present, and it's a pointer to, to, to the future. Why I say it is intertwined? I think it will be very hard for us to say we are going to separate the past from the now. And therefore, the now is kind of going to be delinked from the future because all these items or these periods work together to inform the kind of um, knowledge that we produce in Africa, among other things or experiences that we go through. And therefore, it becomes an impossible task for the artist to pretend not to look at the Africa's historical making. If we are going to say that we are now in the post-colonial era and the past doesn't have anything to do with what we have here, then I think it will be a futile, um, futile attempt. And therefore, what I'm trying to say is that we need to understand that past for us to understand the now and the future. And therefore, we are saying that this then calls for an interrogation, interrogation of Africa's past. So, it, so this then calls for an interrogation of Africa's past in understanding the changing and conflicting realities of the now. And uh, we are um, looking at what uh, Ed Bon tells us that negotiate the existence in a co in coherence, instability, and discontinuity. That is the kind of uh, experiences that we have here. That's a, that is the kind of kind of uh, a person that we have in Africa's post-colonial state, that we are dealing with things that are or issues that are we cannot possibly understand something that is in unstable, and of course we have a lot of discontinuities that have been witnessed in the recent past in as far as Africa is concerned. So the need to reflect. So the need to reflect. 
something that is not working. Okay, fine. So the need to reflect on Africa's past and present to address anxieties about the future through literature informs the discussion. Using illustrations from Welcome to Hilbro and Arrows of Rain, the paper examines realities in Africa. And the next subsection, I'm looking at tracing the past into the now in post-colonial African literature and its implication on the future of the arts. And what I have to acknowledge here is this, that when we are talking about tracing the past and the future, you realize that the kind of early African artists, and I want to look at, uh, for example, to, to give an example of writers, most of them were dealing with the question of colonialism, the impact of colonialism, what colonialism did to the native that now we you know kind of, they were complaining about that particular past. But now we are in the post-colony. What is it that is ailing the post-colony that the African artist is addressing? And therefore, what the, this paper is looking at is the present realities away from colonial masters. That yes, we are here in the post-colonial period, and these are the kind of realities that we are engaging in. So that is why I'm using Mupes, Welcome to Ahilbro, and Okendibes, Arrows of Fame, because uh, the texts I've chosen seem to address that kind of the now and the realities that are there in the post-colony. And uh, on the significance of the past in the present, I'm quoting a character in Arrows of Rain by Okendibe, Paata. Paata is a, a father to, uh, to Ruben, who is a minister in the government, that is Madia government. And after having observed what is happening in the government, this is what uh, Paata says. He raises these questions. Why does our present bear no marks of our past? What is the meaning of our history? These questions can only lead us to one truth, namely that we live in a bastard nation, then we must decide what to do with this illegitimate offspring. I know this will sound radical to you, but the first step is to turn it into a completely different nation. We must be ready to say two things. One, that any section of this country is free to live. Two, that other people not now within our nation can become part of us. That is the only way of making our nation a living organism. So when you look at this particular character in this text, he's kind of underscoring the fact that a nation is a living organism. And it cannot be a living organism without other body, body parts that make up that particular nation. And what are these body parts? It is a human resource. It is the other things that qualify one to be a nation. So therefore, when we are looking at the post-colonial realities, the idea of nationhood here is being raised. What is it that makes us belong to this particular so-called nation that we want to identify with? But we, as we say so, Paata is saying it is a legitimate, illegitimate offspring. Why so? It's because of the kind of things that are happening in a post-colonial state or nation. Such is the scenario of the Africa's contemporary situation. The artist must be conscious of such a reality as he creates, bearing in mind that the post-colonial African society is fragmented and a time in which the past, the now, and the future collide. In an easy pairing, in continuous mistrust of each other, etc. And this is exactly what Paata seems to be saying that uh, the African post-colonial state or society is a fragmented one. If we take ourselves as cases here, look at our relationships with one another, look at the relationship from one nation to the other, and this, what we are calling as a, a continent that uh, Dr. Odiambo alluded to when he said that Africa is, uh, is not a country, and therefore we share that interconnectedness in um, what joins us as, as, as a people in Africa. I will give then you two, one, two more minutes, Violet, so that you can... Okay, I'm rushing. Yes, I will, I will uh, jump some parts. So therefore, when we look at Welcome to Ahilbra, a question of migration, that most African individuals migrate from their areas to other places. And I'm giving an example of Hilbro, where the author or the narrator talks about welcoming migrants there. But the question here, in as much as we talk about a United Nations state or maybe Africa, 
we have the idea of authoring. If we can borrow from Edward Said's ideas of the other, the Orient, and what have you. That yes, we are Africans, but then we also are unbelonging. We lack that identity. And it is that discrimination that exists in Welcome to Our Hill now that raises the question of our unitedness as Africans in this particular continent. And um, still, maybe if I can get something from uh, that particular text to capture what I'm saying. This is what uh, the, author, the narrator says. There are very few Hillbrowans, if you think about it, who were not originally wanderers from Trigalong and other rural areas. So when we talk about Trigalong, it's a, a, a rural place in uh, South Africa. And therefore, yet these people are South Africans. They still are discriminated against because we have drawn those particular lines against those who belong and those who don't belong. And this is the reality in Africa. Then we have the idea of leadership. When you look at leadership, we are also the political leadership, and I will use the example of Arrows of Fame. ACTA complains about leadership that has uh, failed to acknowledge that particular path to guide the way people lead, and therefore leading to an efficient kind of uh, governing, a government that cannot feed its own people. So maybe I will skip some parts. The future of arts in Africa, and this is what I, no, I, I relate to what I've said, reclaiming and reasserting the African image that translates into a coherent and rational African narrative. So therefore, when we are talking about uh, post-colonial literature, we are looking at uh, how writers are not kind of uh, you know, attacking the colonizers' discourse or talking about colonialism, but they are reclaiming their own image, reasserting themselves in addressing the issues that uh, bedevil them, then having deliberate commitment at all levels of nation state building to leverage African socioeconomic resources. If this happens, then you realize the idea of migration may be addressed. Then conclusion from the foregoing discussion, the present African socio-political context cannot be understood without it is historical past. Though history is significant as it highly informs where we are, the future of arts in Africa is robust. Most of the texts now address realities, albeit drawing linkages with the past. This is a pointer on how the literature is or the future of the arts is. That marks the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank that you very much. Uh, we appreciate your taking time. Okay, our next paper our presenter is um, Dr. Richard Makanu Mafula, The Transformations of the Prospero. Um, this paper is entitled The Transformations of the Prospero Caliban Trop in East African Literature. Perhaps I would have modified it a bit to say African literature. Um, it is based on uh, my thinking about uh, Chinua Achebe once when he said, a man who does not know where the rain began to beat him cannot tell where he began drying his body. And so because of that, I wanted to look at the trajectory of colonialism from uh, its... Uh, past written records to the uh, present and the subsequent attempts at seeing how we could redress that condition. Now, if uh, I've not left the title yet, if you look at that word prospero, uh, if you look at that word prospero, you can see uh, very many letters there uh, uh, have something to do with prosperous. Prosperous. And being prosperous uh, means you are flourishing. In uh, Romance languages, 
such as French, Portuguese, Italian, and Sp Spanish. Uh, that's the word for being prosperous, uh, which also means flourishing. Caliban, on the other hand, also has a twist to it. Uh, if you look at it carefully, it also contains letters that form the word cannibal. And uh, that is uh, the trope. The trope, the trope here is the image. Uh, in literature, for those of us who are in literature, when um, an image occurs repeatedly in a, a work of art, it becomes a symbol. For Prospero and Caliban, characters in Shakespeare's play called The Tempest, uh, I've said they have meanings. Prospero for prosperous or flourishing, Caliban for cannibal. When words also have meanings and yet they are proper names, uh, which are not conventionally, conventionally meant to carry meaning, they become allegorical. That means they carry overtones beyond themselves because they carry a semantic uh, content. Uh, the play on which, in which these names are found, Shakespeare's play, is called The Tempest. For the, for the uh, purpose of uh, uh, saving time, I will not go into the details of telling you the story, but uh, generally, is the story of oppression and subjugation. Uh, Prospero, the prosperous man, is overthrown by his brother, and his ship capsizes near an island. They disembark safely and go to an island where they find a 10-year-old boy, and that boy is the one who is called Caliban. He has a mother uh, who, we are told, later by Prospero, was exiled to Tunisia for being a witch. Now, Caliban is described in animalistic images, and as a result of being dehumanized, uh, his uh, humanity is taken away, his island is taken away, and he for forth loses the, uh, the island to, to uh, Prospero. But somehow Prospero, in the process of interacting with him, teaches him language because it appears Caliban did not know any language. So Caliban reaches a point where he says, well, you taught me language, and my profit on it is I know how to curse the red plague, read you for learning me your language. Now, that is the trope, the image of the colonized and the colonizer in, in standard guise from the Shakespearean point of view. This image moved to the Caribbean as a result of the journeys that explorers were making. Uh, for those of you who have read a book by Daniel Defoe, Robinson Crusoe, again, there is a character in Robinson Crusoe who is called Friday. Crusoe discovers him on a day called Friday and names him Friday. And again, 
Whoso makes him his servant. Along those lines, again in the Caribbean, uh, much later now, uh, Carib uh, Caribbean and uh, Prospero appear again in a new uh, transmogrified guise in a play called A Tempest by Amy Zizera. But this Caliban has changed a bit. Uh, although Prospero is still a magician, this Caliban has borrowed uh, a god from the Yoruba called Eshu and another god from the same Yoruba called Shango. And he puts the spirit of his mother together with his gods and begins fighting Prospero. In fact, here he doesn't acknowledge that he learned any language. What he does, he says he learned no language. All he learned was gibberish. So, uh, we have that. Then we also have uh, an evocation of the same in George Laming, Pleasures of Exile. And then, of course, in another play, a pantomime, uh, which is uh, trying to dramatize what uh, uh, happened in Robinson Crusoe. But now, in a pantomime by um, Derek Walcott, the, the situation of the servant and the master is so relative that uh, the power relations are not uh, being portrayed properly. That's how uh, it's emerging in the Caribbean. Then, when it comes to the African continent, uh, we have writers now who have adopted the English language. But instead of using it to curse alone, they are using it to curse, but also they are using it uh, as a way of sorting out all sorts of problems. Um, some of these writers you can see uh, are like Shinua Achebe, and even uh, uh, Leopold uh, said the same go. Uh, and in a way, uh, Leopold said the same go, uh, again uh, evokes what happens in the Caribbean in the sense that he has a very, uh, a very kind uh, view towards uh, the uh, prosperous language and prosperous culture. In Eastern Africa, uh, we have um, Manon writing in the early 60s uh, in the wake of the emerging new states of Africa. And Manon, uh, writing in the context of uh, Madagascar, says that uh, Caliban cannot sustain his independence because he suffers from a serious dependency syndrome. He suffers from a, a very serious dependency syndrome. Uh, maybe this is not fair in view of what other Calibans are doing, but I think uh, Madagascar being uh, French-speaking, uh, Probably Manon might have seen what some of the leaders, uh, Francophone leaders, were doing at the time. Uh, recently, I was re reading a clip on, um, on um, Embara Bokassa, and uh, Embara Bokassa used to work in the French army during the time when uh, General de Gaulle was leading that army. And Bokassa, Richard, I must give you just two minutes more. Oh, and Bokassa said, uh, Bokassa was always calling uh, the call Papa. All the time, he used to call him Papa. And when, uh, uh, 
when uh, the call asked him not to call him Papa, he said, we Papa. I don't know what we means because I don't, I'm not French speaking. Uh, yes, so he replied the same way. So uh, maybe that was his interpretation of the Caliban. And perhaps that was also one of the problems we had with the, uh, some of our uh, first generation African leaders. Ngugi um, Wadiongo in the early 70s also adopts the, the Prospero Caliban trope in the sense that he uses English just the way uh, uh, Achebe uses to fight for Kenya's uh, uh, selfhood, Kenyan selfhood, uh, independence, and so on and so forth. But in the late uh, 70s, he changes and uh, thinks that perhaps Caliban will do better uh, with his own tongue. And that's why he goes to talk about uh, using his mother tongue. Uh, his mother language in order to express uh, what uh, might have been uh, expressed in English. However, there's a problem here because of the, uh, of the facility of the mother tongue. Uh, Ngugi Wadionga has had trouble because as much as he tries to uh, communicate in mother language, he has to write essays again as if they are apologetics, they are as if they are apologetics for, for the writing in a, in a mother tongue. Uh, but, but at least we could see the agency. The, there was some agency there in Caliban, especially with the, the Camerizu experiments, uh, as I will show in the whole paper. Then, of course, we come to Kiswahili in uh, uh, Tanzania, where Nyerere uh, and uh, Mushi show that uh, Caliban can also have his language translated into Prospero's language. And here, he does so by translating Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar, whereas Mushi translates the Tempest again, so that now Caliban has become a bit hybrid, but also he can express himself in his language. Uh, we have uh, those plays there. Then we have uh, uh, writers like uh, Hussein, who write about the state of colonialism in uh, Kiswahili. And they show Caliban's language very thinly, because there's only one strange word apart from the English of the characters who are alienated. Kashala seritwas, which means cash it all out as it was. Now, that shows that now Caliban has been able uh, to gain his own language and the, the language of Prospero is on the margins. Now, from what I've seen, uh, we can try to avoid Prospero for as much as possible, but it appears he's quite into us because uh, we have been with him for so long. But, but what my lessons are, uh, what my lesson is from this presentation is that uh, we can borrow from the post-colonial colonial writers like uh, uh, Spivak, who say that um, although reductionism or essentialism is not tenable because nobody is pure, a strategic essentialism can help us redeem ourselves. Thank you. Beautiful allegory there. Thank you so much, Richard. I don't know if you have the other two. I think, I think we have um, Joseph Akatema online. Okay. Joseph, please. Good 
afternoon, uh, colleagues. Good afternoon, mentors. Good afternoon, fathers. It's an honor to be in this wonderful uh, occasion to, uh, in part, honor our own father, the most estimable uh, gem of Africa and the world. Um, I'm looking at language and cultural imperialism in the political economy of the media in Ghana. Even though I am saying Ghana once in a while, I may uh, draw examples from uh, Nigeria and uh, other countries to make my point. First of all, I must insist that the discourse on language and imperialism uh, gained a significant momentum in the colonial era. First, when the colonial forces encountered uh, hundreds and hundreds of African languages and the need to have one uh, language, in some instances English, other instances Portuguese and French, for the purposes of administration and uh, other works. So the media becomes one of the critical instruments, and I am a student of media uh, in Ghana. and. Currently, there are certain troubling observations in the media landscape in Ghana, and uh, that calls for a discussion of this nature. Now, um, first of all, uh, I engage the writings of uh, uh, Professor Ngugi Wationgu, and he talks about language in two forms. One, uh, as the tool of uh, empowerment and a certain instances, the lack of it, a tool of alienation. For instance, we haven't this discourse in English mostly, and uh, once in a while, our estimable guests, which depends on level of Kiswahili, which some of us do not uh, entirely understand. But so, if uh, mm -hmm. you speak French, you speak Spanish, you speak Portuguese, and on top of that, you speak English, everywhere you find yourself, you will be empowered. But the lack of it, uh, brings what we call a uh, alienation in some aspects. Now, when we come to uh, the media and culture, uh, there is a certain link, a certain harmony uh, with that in history. Post-colonial media, Africans uh, were seen as barbaric. We have a lot of forms that uh, 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 depict us as such, and I will not want to dwell so much on that. We have uh, Africa Speaks, 19... 29 and it's actually a European voice speaking with some images and the images are supposed to mean something else. We have the uh, Legend of Kazakh series and most of these series depict us as persons uh, of less civility. And so given these uh, forms of uh, derogatory stereotypical images uh, there is they understand. I'm trying to share my slides, but I cannot, so I'll continue. When the host permits me, I will share it. Um, there is uh, some level of understanding that with the attainment of independence, uh, culture, media, and with the earlier information that language was one of the critical instruments that empowered uh, colonial forces to uh, depict Africans as the lesser other uh, will be one of the rallying points that will allow Africans to, you know, champion their own uh, media struggle. And in Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah did that. Apart from promoting language, he insisted that certain policies and structures were set in place to promote the image and identity of the African in many ways that uh, one can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he uh, encouraged the production of Afrocentric uh, forms to numerous dimensions. Yeah, please, can you see my screen? Please, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen clearly. Thank you very much. So, uh, one of the problematic, the problem concerns, uh, 
uh, if our own professor, estimable professor Watiangu, talks about uh, writing in the Kikuyu, I uh, don't know if I'm right. And uh, there is a certain sense of uh, uh, problematic there because the person has to be Kikuyu literate if uh, Professor Yekum of Ghana decides to write in Akan, uh, whatever uh, cultural expression or literature, there is a, a certain expectation of an understanding of Akan literacy to be able to ask to it, it is, uh, make meaning of such cultural and uh, uh, anti colonial products when they come. Now, but when it comes to media, you may not necessarily have to be uh, illiterate in English, illiterate in uh, Yoruba, Igbo, Katsin, Akan to be able to invite a film that is produced. So that is one of the problematic risks. Uh, a text, first of all, at most instances, to be able to comprehend it, read it, and comprehend it requires some level of literacy. You know, even though it may be in the local language, that form becomes one of the powerful tools, apart from the audiovisual images that are churned out that one can really deduce using uh, uh, personal inferences or reading meaning into the visual. If, for instance, we have a uh, Aruba by our own father, Tunde Kelani, and the language is the Yoruba, a Yoruba person, you don't have to be a professor in Yoruba linguistics to be able to you know, relate to the visuals that are being shared. Now, since time is not our best ally, um, I talk about the political economy of the media alongside cultural imperialism. And in that discourse, I uh, recognize from my study that Hollywood has made a very significant mark in Ghana, and like most parts of uh, Africa, Sri Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, even though there are uh, linguistic differences. However, Hollywood is able to, sorry, I'm, I want to say no rule. No rule is able to uh, penetrate into our society, especially the Katsina society, Akan society, because of the cultural uh, 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 similarities. They have uh, Eze, uh, they have Chuku, they have Agbala, and all that. There is a sense of uh, cultural affinity with regard to how we hold kinship, how we promote, how we promote them, how we hold our days. And so, that in it, that though it's cultural imperialism, it's not so much a challenge as what we currently have. And I have studied that in about four uh, television stations in Ghana, which were set up with a core mandate of promoting African or Ghanaian ideology. You know, uh, the legal framework in Ghana, you need to have uh, indicate or demonstrate that you so 40% local content, and that is Ghanaian, and 60%. Uh, 60% Ghanaian content, and then 40% uh, foreign content. And that foreign content includes uh, African content. Now, what is happening, and the studies that I have from the blog, uh, there is a clear indication that uh, most of the television stations, you know, after being shut up, they now go to uh, Mexico, they go to Singapore, they go to India, they go to China, and collect certain media products, mostly telenovelas and so forth. And what they do is to dive them into the local languages. And these telenovelas have gained significant ground and have successfully pushed some of the local uh, film producers out of business, especially the ones renowned uh, uh, and striving Kumawood industry, Kasswood industry. Kumawood is film industry for uh, the largest uh, ethnic speaking people in Ghana, Akan, and other persons. They have also influenced uh, uh, directorial styles and content, violence, obscenity, vulgar language, and there has been troubling concerns with uh, this kind of uh, new cultural imperialism, not necessarily from Hollywood. Prior to uh, the post-colonial and immediate colonial days, struggle or the arguments most of the time with regards to Ghana and most parts of the world had been one of Hollywood, but some of these uh, newer forces uh, have emerged. Uh, it is important to mention that they are not the frontiers. It is us Africans, it is us Ghanaians who have set up the television station with a core mandate of promoting our cultural identity. And now with the lack or the cost of producing our own 
products, we conveniently fall on those products. Uh, and that is the telenovelas from Mexico and others. It is important to mention uh, legislatures like uh, current uh, Speaker of Parliament, uh, Right Honorable uh, Tumani Bagbin, and before him, Professor Aaron Michael Quay, and other producers within the Ghanaian film industry lamented, lamented that most of these telenovelas are a par with African values, African culture, as they are always talking about violence of rape, blackmail, uh, uh, looting, drug addiction, and all that. Even do, though sometimes it's difficult Joseph, to measure the exact Joseph, uh, effect. Joseph, I'll, gi I'll give you another two minutes to sum up. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It is difficult to measure the exact effect this could have on the, the populace. There have been growing concerns, and other states have found out that it is creating what we call taste and desires. And when I talk about taste and desires alongside cultural imperialism, uh, we have, they have certain periods that they saw this song, they are at the peak. And at that peak, there is struggle for adverse because within the block, a lot of viewers, those times take a lot of viewership. So a lot of persons, mostly from uh, the foreign community, push their product. Local competitors are not able to advertise. And so it is, increasingly creating taste and desire. And now, one significant thing that came out from the block viewership is the presence of a uh, huge women fellowship with, between the ages of 25, 30 uh, to the ages of 35 and 65. And the block indicates that sometimes 65% of those on the block fall within this category, affirming what the speakers, both speakers past and present, uh, alleged. So they use timing, they use adverts, they use uh, tree, that is Akan language dubbing, and they use that because apart from the Akan ethnic groups, most Ghanaians speak that language, and they, they, these are few uh, followers. Beyond these findings, there is the need to also talk about enforcement Enforce, uh, enforcing legislation, uh, those persons who are not able to pass it, uh, fall in line with certain directives of promoting African identity, African culture. Uh, it's my suggestion by way of conclusion to have some form of uh, their licenses uh, revoked and uh, the need for us as Africans to continue to create and produce content that can reach African people in a sustained manner. And I say this because I have engaged students who are not familiar with productions of uh, Tunde Kilani. They are not, uh, we have Aruba, Sauru we have even other uh, indigenous forms in indigenous languages that are not being shown on our national television. The reason uh, is partly because assessing these films comes at a cost. So why not go to Mexico? Why not go to. Uh, 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 India and other places and get cheap products which are about 30 years ago but do not talk to our culture and then uh, use it at their media station. Thank so uh, this time is not our best ally. I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if we have uh, Yvonne Chibeze. Yvonne? I think uh, she had not responded when we started. So we'll take some questions. No. We'll take some questions uh, from the audience. Then um, the various uh, presenters will uh, answer. Any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for for the different papers. Um, I, I, I have a question, or rather, it's a question actually for all of them. Eh? Uh, that um, first, I want all of you really to think of and comment on literature as a political act and as a process of archiving. So you know whether you're talking about 
um, what do we do with Prosper and Caliban's language? Uh, to what extent um, is um, the writings, uh, political acts, and processes of archiving? Um, and, and that includes even the comment, the, the talk on um, language, the media language for expression of political economy, that um, when people write, uh, um, could they be acting politically because other spaces of political activism uh, are not um, uh, working? And then the second one for any of them, all these speakers, eh, um, What's, what's your comment on the fact that literature today uh, literally performs um, the work of historical uh, recording and that literature probably today is the best carrier of history from below? Thank you. Thank you. In the media as well, yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, mine is with the characterization of Orientalism as a, a Middle Eastern and a Near Eastern conception as portrayed by the imperialists, but redefined by Edward Said, by trying to give an interpretation of post-structuralism that becomes the basis of interpreting the cultures of the East. Now, one of the presenters therefore talks about the Middle East and the Near East, forgetting that part of that Middle East is really African, that if you look at Sudan, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, they are caught up in that interpretation of Middle East, but they are significantly in Africa. And therefore, are we right to restrict Orientalism to that geographical demarcation when Africa and its interpretation is caught up in that wave? And I want to point out Mahmoud Mamdani, his ancestry is in India, which is not in the Middle East, which is not in the Near East. But Mamdani, an Indian, is an East African citizen domiciled in Uganda, and he was largely influenced by Edward Said. In fact, if you look at citizen and subject, is basically a reenactment of the Edward Said kind of post-structuralism now in an African setting. And again, if you look at uh, Mudimbe, you look at uh, Anthony Appiah, their notions of the post-colonial is really a replacement of the analytical framework of Orientalism, but now in black African setting. So to what extent can we restrict Orientalism to the Middle East and uh, the Near East. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, let me have that. We have uh, two questions online. Um, Pelam, Falaj, Falajimi, and uh, Omotola, Olubani. Yeah, thank you. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, the first person that asked a question in the auditorium, you know, spoke about literature being both a political and historical document. Of course, I will agree, everybody, every learned person in art will agree with that. Um, the fact that he refers to history as something documented by literature will compel me to to suggest that we read um, Tony Fowler's book published last year, titled, uh, I, I don't have the exact title now, but it sounds like Literature and Nigerian Nationhood, where Tony Fowler explains 
the role of literature, the role of literature in preserving Nigerian history, apart from engaging the Nigerian political atmosphere. Having said that, I want to respond to Oluwa Bukumi, who presented a few minutes ago. He, he said he, he, had, he spoke about post-colonialism and African literature. I observed that he demonstrates familiarity with Nigerian literature, mentioning Achebe, Amos Tutuola, and in fact, Dio Fagunwa. My curiosity is, of course, he spoke about resistance, literature performing the function of resistance against colonialism. Now, my curiosity about his presentation is the role of history in writing literature of resistance, the role of history and the impacts of history in writing the literature of resistance. His examples were majorly from Nigeria, Achebe especially, and Tutuola and Fagunwa in part. My, my interest lies in East African, you know, East African literature and their attitude to resistance to colonialism. I see a very strong impact of history in that okay. East Africa has a bloody experience of colonialism. We had that experience in Kenya, for example, the Mau Mau revolt, the impact of the Kimati, which has been documented in, 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 in drama by Ngugi and, and Mr. Gita Mugu. We have a similar experience in, in, in Tanzania. You know, uh, Ibrahim Hussein's King Jekitili tells us about it. You know, Kenya and Tanzania had a very bloody and violent experience of colonialism. And that bloody experience translates into the, into the nature of literatures, literary works that they produced. The examples of Ngugi Wathiongo and Gisem Semugu and Ibrahim Hussein Kizyeke Tilif, you know. Okay. So uh, my curiosity and question to Oluwa Bukumi now is, what do you consider as the impact of history in the production of literature of resistance in Africa? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. One more, Umutola. You there? No, there's one more online, then you can take. Omotola, you have a question? Are you yes, I do. Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes, can you we, hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. My my question is, we're talking about literature, and I remember there was this conference I attended in February, of Professor Bolanle away conference that Ibadan and. We are talking about, I remember the, it was a particular presentation. We're talking about Efushetan and Miwura and how that another woman was mis misrepresented in history, or you know, rather in literature. What I see is that it's in, for, for the people in literature, at times, how do, we, how do you go around it? Because in literature, it, it's actually motivated by profit most of the time. You want to write stories that people can appeal to, that they can read and they can enjoy. Yes. But at times in, in history, how do, you, how do you match that together? Because when you look at the book of the book by Professor Akinumi on official time, Ura, Professor Bolanle we had talked about that book, that the book did not fully represent the story of that woman. And when Professor Kuru was, was accosted, he said, he just went out to write a book, not necessary to present historical facts. Okay. So what I'm saying is that what how do we draw that line that in writing literature you want to write something that somebody can enjoy, then how do you reconcile it with history? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good question there. Uh, I think any of the speakers can take any of the questions. Uh, they are varied or just uh, make comments. Yes, Richard. Can I take can I start? One minute. Um I'll have I'll have Richard Muhanu Muhanu take take the first one. Um, thank you very much for the questions. I would like to react on the question of uh, literature and history. Um, I think in the academy, the division of these disciplines uh, 
into categories is basically uh, arbitrary. Uh, we can uh, read history in literature and literature in history. And uh, perhaps there are some historical uh, elements that we may not uh, intervene in literary discourses in an immediate and direct way, just as there, are, there may be a few literary um, texts that may not be uh, uh, of historical uh, significance in an immediate and direct way. But from my traditional reading about literature of commitment, about literature uh, as, as didactic as well as entertainment, I believe that literature can properly inform history. As a matter of fact, I teach a, a course called um, Literature in History. So, uh, they, they are, they are, they are, of course, there are boundaries, but they really inform each other. Because if you look at the themes, if you look at the styles, they are all narratives. And uh, they ask the same questions. They, they follow certain sequences, uh, especially when you are talking about fiction. And as in the case of Kenya, for example, uh, of course, there were very many arguments about the relationship between history and, and uh, literature uh, in, the, in the 80s and 70s. But still, that was an acknowledgment to some extent of their relationship. Um, uh, comment on literature's political acts and the process of arch archiving. I don't know whether, uh, Professor, I got your question right. Literature uh, as a political act. He, uh, well, um, now that um, we are in an, env an environment where um, I think uh, uh, some of our subjects have to be used to liberate us, and literature is one of them. Uh, Ngugi led the way uh, for us. If you look at uh, what Semben Osman was doing in, uh, in uh, West Africa, South African literature has also been very propagandistic. I think uh, not all propaganda is literature, but uh, some propaganda is li uh, literature. That's how I can answer. Uh, to what extent can you confine Orientalism to the East? Is that Professor's question? Uh, I think the, uh, if the theory, the, 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 that theory can apply as well to the, the African uh, subaltern, because uh, uh, if you look at what uh, Edward Said does, is uh, almost exactly uh, uh, what uh, the colonial, uh, uh, the, the colonizer, the colonist in Africa did to the African. Uh, they, they gave him a, a, a certain category. They may be different environments, but I think they are fundamentally the same. Orientalism can be used here also. Thank you. Thank you. Any of the other speakers can uh, take any of the questions and just add. I'll give uh, two of you a chance, then we can uh, call it a day. Abraham? Uh, or impact of history in writing literature of resistance. Um, first and foremost, I, I would like to know that my paper centers on Nigeria, you see Nigeria as a case study. Now, why I believe that um, history provides a good uh, fundamental basis 
for writing literature, I come across a particular term which was a little bit complex for me to me at first, and that term is called historical fiction. Then I began to realize that, okay, in historical fiction, I think one of the things that they try to do is to make sure that um, why a part of it is history, um, they also try as much as possible for uh, public consumption to add things like suspense, to add things like um, every other literary part or change. So I think in, in historical fiction or in, in writing literature that is uh, that is related to history, um, history is very, very important in working around that because that provides a base of research. There's no way you're going to write about uh, Afonja or there's no way you're going to write about Sango that you won't have a proper knowledge of what Yoruba history is. I hope that has answered your question. Okay, okay. Any, any more? Yeah. Um, yes. My own, my own response to start from a very simple and modest point is, for instance, today's happening can be history tomorrow. And uh, from media perspective, uh, we do agree that most of the time we condense time and space so that we can be able to communicate certain issues and ideas. First, from most of the time, it's political act is ideological. If you look at the works of Usman Sandani, you will even see that he threatens me and he has portraits of America Cabral, Fanon, Mandela, Che Guevara, and all that. That in itself communicates a certain level of resistance and political ideology and identity. Now, we look at uh, archiving. Uh, he found Kambi Tairoi, which captures the happenings of uh, the, the post uh, Second World War happenings, where most of the Sinhalese forces uh, were killed or murdered at the camp. And this saw that from 1988. And they may have lived and witnessed some of the events, but most of the time, too, there is a need to do research. Um, one of the presenters mentioned about money or capital. So is capital intensive. And victory has many fathers. So when we look at Polo's perspective, most of the times what they do to ask black Africans is to treat the stories in ways that suggest that we are the lesser others. And so if you look at heritage Africa produced by uh, the father of Ghanaian cinema for answer, you will notice we highlight strongly the resistance of Pan and Kuma and other uh, black in those terms. And so Archiving is very, very important. As for capital, those who are doing uh, the capital, with the producing film with some level of capital intention, they fictionalize some major and significant historical happenings that are mostly and sometimes demeaning to us Africans. And by and large, most of these are produced sometimes, not only by Hollywood and some of uh, their uh, African-American counterparts who do not have spiritual, uh, cultural, attribution or link to the continent. So uh, for me, this is uh, one of the, the comments. And our own Kwanza, in one of the interviews that we had with him, and he's still alive anyway, indicated that when he was uh, trying to uh, put together the script uh, of Heritage Africa, uh, the British approached him and made an offer of, and we are talking 1987, 1.5 million pounds so that he could factor in the British story a bit. What was okay. their interest? Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I don't know if there are any last comments. I would like us to bring this to a close. Um, Something to comment on. I don't know if uh, it was said by my colleagues. Yes, I was well, thrown yes. out. And I, yes. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to re respond to some of the questions that were raised. Yes. I don't know if they were addressed by my other presenters, but I want to say something about Orientalism. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question about uh, how Orientalism was used and, uh, of course, uh, applied to Middle East and so forth and so forth. But what I also want to point out is this, uh, that when we are talking about post-colonial period, where we are right now, I think uh, it is some, it's a, a, a concept that is relative. We have some sections or uh, regions that were not colonized, yet they are also considered as post-colonial societies or regions. 
And therefore, when we are talking about Orientalism here, I think we, it can be appropriated to other regions. So that when we are talking about the I, the other, the Orient, and so forth, it can still be applied to other regions um, you know, beyond just talking about uh, Middle East. And I think it applies to the African situation where we are looking at the different things or items that uh, make us dissimilar and similar in one way or the other. And I will use uh, an illustration from what I presented, that when we look at the idea of belonging, it highly borders on this, uh, this concept, that we have that ability to say we belong to this entity, and at the same time, we are capable of saying you don't belong here. So therefore, the idea of Orient, I think it can be appropriated to other regions. Then a quick one on resistance, literature and resistance. I think it will also depend on how the term resistance is used. One of the presenters mentioned about a bloody resistance in East Africa. So we are looking at those armed uprisings that were agitating for independence. But now when we look at uh, an artist, how does an artist, uh, for example, resist? So we are looking at that assertiveness, that reclaiming, that uh, having that um, ability, that self-esteem kind of bestowed. So therefore, when we talk about resistance, I think literature has ability to do that. Whether it's the resistance in terms of uh, saying no to things or cultures that are not appropriate or things that are not appropriate to kind of armed uh, uprisings like Maji Maji, Mau Mau, among other things. A quick one on what uh, Omotola asked about history and literature. I think history and literature can be said to be like cousins or sisters because uh, they build one another. And uh, quite a number of literal texts uh, have uh, some kind of uh, advanced um, historical material. Name most of them, look at uh, a man of the people, look at uh, coming to birth, look at um, the river and the source, among others. You realize that it has some aspect of uh, that historical making of such kind of regions. But at the same time, it is creative. It entertains us. It, the way you are saying that it makes you enjoy. We enjoy reading because we have that aspect of imagination, creativity, and so forth. So I think that is what I can add on okay. what uh, my colleagues have said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Violet. And thank you all, uh, the presenters this afternoon. I think uh, very rich uh, conversations there on uh, post-colonial literature and the future of the arts. We've come to the end of the day. Um, I don't see any of the organizers in the room. Are they there? Oh, yeah. Here he is, yes. I was looking for that shirt. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I think we need another round of applause. Um, that has been a very exciting session, at least to close uh, the day. I just want to, again, apologize for uh, lagging time, uh, back in time, but I think we should be able to catch up uh, as we move on tomorrow. Our sessions tomorrow begin at 9.30. Uh, we urge you to come slightly early so that we can also uh, end the session slightly earlier in the evening. Uh, we have an evening debt tomorrow, uh, an invitation for dinner. So we want to urge all of you to come uh, so that we move uh, together. We have an interesting 30 minutes morning session from 9.30 to 10, uh, a conversation around uh, Toin Falola which is going to be led by Professor Mtabi. We wish that all of you uh, come on time. But for today, I think, uh, let's stop here. We want to thank all of you, and of course those of, of us who are online, uh, for having kept with us, even as we, uh, we stray in terms of time management. 
Uh, we have our coffee, tea downstairs ready. Please don't leave without taking that tea because it's, we were meant to take it earlier, but this was just a hidden strategy to try and manage time. So all of you are invited for, for the tea before we leave. Thank you very much for the day and see you tomorrow. Um, in Kenya, for example, the floods, the frequency